Alan Shipnuck has been covering golf for Sports Illustrated, 25 years on the beat. And uh, he has a, a book, Phil, The Rip Roaring, an unauthorized biography of golf's most colorful superstar, available online wherever books are sold. Why do you think the Live Tour has already won versus the PGA Tour, Alan? Because it's slightly more nuanced than that, Dan, but they, they definitely have um, taken a lot of turf here. And, uh, you know, there's more players coming and there's some big names coming. And there's a critical mass of major championship winners, Hall of Famers, big time personalities. They just can't be ignored anymore uh, in the marketplace. Uh, you know, as as golf fans, even though the competition does not stir the soul, um, there's too much energy here now. And the tour has hemorrhaged too much star power. There's really not enough players in golf that we care about to sustain two tours, barely enough for one tour. And you start splitting up these guys. Um, the PJ Tour has promised a certain product to its fans and its advertisers, and they've they've lost a lot of the players that drive the tour. And so, um, it's at some point a concession is going to have to be made. And this notion that the the major championships are going to freeze out um, the live players is nonsensical. I mean, there's just too many past champions. There's too many big time players. I mean, the majors get the spotlight one week a year. They want the best field possible. They want their past champions. And then the, the other line of defense for the tour is maybe uh, live won't get world ranking points. But again, are you giving world ranking points to the corn fairy tour with a bunch of like college kids and old timers? No one's ever heard of. And you're not going to give it to <laughs> this tour that has a bunch of big time players. It makes no sense. So the, um, those, those were the kind of the last stands for the tour, the majors in the world ranking, but I think they're going to lose both those battles. And then, they're gonna have to, they're gonna have to cut some sort of uh, sort of deal to bring to bring the game back together in one piece. Well, congratulations, first of all, getting credentialed because that's a big <laughs> step for you. Didn't you uh, you get thrown out of a tournament earlier this year? Yeah, well, the first the first live event in London, and that was Phil Mickelson's return to public life. And um, I had I had recently published a biography about Phil Mickelson, and the, um, it was not the live folks in the final analysis who, who got me tossed it, after doing snooping around and talking to a lot of people, it seems very likely that it was Phil's own overprotective management company. And this little wormy dude, they employ who sick the, the security goons on me. So um, it was a wild overreaction, but it's a funny story. And uh, yes, I was credentialed for that tournament. And there's only two reporters now who have been to all three events, myself and, and Bob Harrig. And um <laughs> It's not that I'm pro live. I'm just trying to understand what is a humongous story in the sports world. And there's a lot of people on the sidelines who are pontificating and pointing fingers and shouting. I'm actually trying to talk to people and do some real reporting. So, uh, but I you're in Jersey now. You're at the the, the Trump Bedminster Golf Course. Um, can you set the scene where there are protests with families from 9/11 victims out front? They weren't visible the way um, that, that I came in. You know, this is really Trump likes to say this course is 20 minutes from the Lincoln Tunnel. I mean, maybe if you have a helicopter, it is, we are way out in the wilds of New Jersey. I mean, it, it's lovely rolling horse country and there's big estates and it looks like a nice place to live. But it is the middle of nowhere. And so there's just these two lane country roads leading into um, the, the course and they're never going to let a protest happen in that space is too dangerous. And so, okay. you know, I was, I was at the U S women's open here when Trump was a sitting president and those protests then, and they kind of created a designated zone a couple miles away, which was unsatisfying to the, the protesters. They couldn't really be heard or seen, but it probably made sense from a safety standpoint. So it, I think it's gonna be the same thing this week when you're on the grounds, you'll have no idea any of that's happening. You'll have to go find them if you want to see the protesters. What is Charles Barkley's value, the potential for Charles joining the value for the live tour and not much i think it's almost negative because if they're trying to be taken seriously as as a a real legit golf tour we all love charles barkley right but he's kind of a sideshow he's not a golf guy he's a bit of a court jester and he adds entertainment value but i think it actually hurts their credibility so mm. i think live has gotten what they want in this seduction they're in the headlines charles is here playing the pro-am i saw him on the range a few minutes ago swing looks decent uh, it looks but nervous. the format is hokey already with the live tour. I mean, I, that so Charles can right. add so, to the hokiness of it. 
yeah, if you want to lean in on hokiness, but they want to be taken seriously. So that, that's why I don't, I don't think Charles is a good choice for them. Uh, I mean, they already have David Faraday, who has a, a wicked sense of humor and he can he can entertain fans. But he's, you know, a writer cupper and he's been in the golf world for thir- three decades as a commentator. Like Faraday brings a certain star power, but also a gravitas that is woefully lacking with Cyril Charles, despite his, his lofty title. So um, I, I don't. Maybe they'll bring him in for a few broadcasts just for comic relief, but it would be a monumental mistake to sign him up for every every broadcast. I think the hardcore golf fans would be turned off. Well, he said that he was not given an offer by Norman when they went to dinner, and he was not told about a TV partner, although he told me earlier in the week that there will be a TV partner. Who are you hearing is going to carry the live tour? That's a work in progress, but that that's, you know, the, the eyeballs will follow the players and we know this in every other sport like you're you're a lebron james fan and you cheer for him no matter when he switches jerseys and golf has suddenly entered the 2020s right where players are switching teams and they're switching jerseys and if you're a brooks kepka fan i'm I'm sure uh or a phil mickelson fan or a bubba watson fan who they just announced today um I'm sure they some people have been turned off because we know the where the money's coming from on the live tours makes people uncomfortable and that's legit. But uh, ultimately, you know, the players are their own franchises, and I think that that uh, they're gonna, you know, the fans will follow them to, to a large degree, and there will be a demand to watch them play golf, and uh, you know, therefore a network or a streaming service or both is going to sign up. What do you make of the PGA Tour strategy so far? It's been a mixed bag, to say the least. I mean, that, uh, you know, Monahan, Jay Monahan, the PG Tour commissioner, was honest. You know, we can't outspend these guys. We can't compete dollar for dollar. Everyone knows that. It's obvious. So what they've tried to do, they've had a two-pronged strategy. One is to villainize the Saudis and the Live Tour and say, we're the, we're the good guys and they're the bad guys. That's a losing strategy. The players have voted with their feet. Like, they don't care. They're taking the money. Like, that's been made obvious. And... That's been that's been the case in golf for a very long time. I mean, the European PJ Tour would have gone out of business years ago without money from China and Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates and Qatar. And without, you know, autocratic, oppressive regimes, there would be no European tour. The players made peace with that a long time ago. Hmm. So the moral argument, the tour is already lost. Uh, they've, now they've, they've tried to lean on tradition and the value of, of history and legacy and, again, a lot of the players have cut bait on that as well. Like, you know, they care about the majors and they're still going to be able to play the majors. Um, there's not much difference, I think, for a lot of these guys between the Greater Hartford Open and the Live Event in Portland and the Phoenix Open and the Live Event in, in New Jersey. Like, it feels the same. They're, they're professional golfers. By definition, they play golf for money. There's a hell of a lot more money here. So, um, so morality didn't work. Tradition didn't work. So, now you know what Satoru has left. That's what they're trying to figure out. Because I don't fault them. That's kind of all they had. They they can't outspend these guys. But um, you know, it, so far they're zero for two. So I, we'll see what they cook up next in Ponte Vedra Beach. Play nice there, Alan. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Yeah. yeah, you got it. Thanks for having me. Down. All right, that's Alan Shipna. Been covering golf for a long time. I think got credentialed again. So he wrote the book uh, on Phil and uh, seven other books there.